What's up, everybody? Noah Kisser back here for another episode of Noah Kisser Live. I tried a brand new intro. Hope you guys like it. So let's get right into it. We got a lot to get to this week. So this one is pre-recorded because I am under an embargo for a movie. So that movie is going to be a family affair on Netflix as well. We got some news topics. Baby Driver 2 is in development as well as Maxine has reviews out and they say it's great. Downton Abbey 3 gets a release date and... Deadpool 3 was dead before Hugh Jackman sent Ryan Reynolds a text. So let's get right into it. First up, we're going to be talking about A Family Affair. A Family Affair is the brand new Netflix rom-com that is going to premiere tomorrow on Netflix. So this film is all about Joey King named Zaro, and she quits her job as the personal assistant to Hollywood heartthrob Chris Cole, played by Zac Efron. She unwittingly sets the stage for a chance encounter between Chris and her famous writer mom named Brooke, played by Nicole Kidman. It's only a matter of time before Brooke and Chris realize they have an undeniable chemistry, which leads to a laugh out loud, to laugh out loud problems and consequences as Zara's boss attempts to woo her mother. This multi-generational coming of age romantic comedy follows each of each of the characters as they tangle as the tangled complications of love, sex, and identity cause problems. This film I was very interested in because I'm a Netflix doc, a guy. I love Netflix. I am a massive fan of rom-coms. So this one was right at my alley. This one I did not even remember a trailer for. All I know is I remember seeing that it was coming out. So Netflix was nice enough to send me a screener for it, and thank you to Netflix. This film is phenomenal. I love this movie. This gave me everything I wanted. It's charming. It's funny. It has heart. Everybody le learns a lesson. You see the characters grow, so let's get right into it. Joey King plays Zara. Zara is the personal assistant of Zac Efron, and we see her doing all these things for him, like going and getting him all his groceries, taking them to his house. She, she, she knows all of his other assistants his cook, his maid, his bodyguards, all the press that want to take all the pictures of him because he's the biggest movie star in the world in Chris Cole. He has a massive, a massive franchise, massive franchise that is going strong, but the movies aren't that good either. They're just making money because they have a massive amount of action in them and Chris Cole is super duper attractive. So that's why everybody, everybody is so into these movies. So, so Chris Cole in this movie starts out as an unlikable character. What we get here is an unlikable character that is likable because we see him grow. He becomes more likable as the movie goes on. Nicole Kidman plays the mother of Zara named Brooke, and their chemistry is undeniable. This is not the first time that we've seen them in a movie. I've not seen their other film together uh, with Efron and Kidman in The Paperboy. I will be watching that one sooner rather than later. I have that on my Amazon Prime watch list. But this film is a really good film because the chemistry is there. It has laugh out loud moments that made me laugh. And it's a short little hour and 45 minute film that does have its issues. And part of that issue is the runtime. There are scenes that could have been trimmed out of here to cut it down just a little bit to maybe make, make it feel a little bit shorter. Because there are moments here where scenes go on too long. And some scenes that felt a little unnecessary. And a subplot involving Z Zara's friend. That she does learn a lesson. But the characters are rarely seen. And the climax that happens between her and her friend. We never actually see the boyfriend. With the issue that happens there. We hardly ever see the boyfriend. So why do we care about that? It's mostly about this character and her friend. But the friend is never seen. So that character was kind of useless to me as a watcher. I'm like, why is she in here? She's a fine character. Don't get me wrong. She's very likable. But the issue is you take away from the actual plot of this film and adding in a subplot that is just unneeded and adds a little too much onto the runtime because Zara does learn a little bit of a lesson to not turn it back on her friends but the issue is that we don't care about the friend. We don't care about her issue that's going on because we never saw her with her boyfriend enough to really care. And there is a predictability to this film. That's not a bad thing because it's a rom-com. You want predictability with your rom-coms. It's hard to do a rom-com that is unpredictable. This movie is very likable. Zac Efron, you see him grow as a character because Zara isn't the biggest fan of this relationship between her boss and in Chris Cole, and her mom, Brooke. <clears throat> However, 
she sees how happy it makes her mom. Her mom has not dated in probably about 10, 15, 20 years, it seems like. So this movie really does show you the growth of Zac Efron's character of Chris Cole. Chris Cole grows because you're seeing him care about a person for the first time in forever. This person is not just a person to sleep with. There's moments here where there's a nice callback to something that happens earlier in the film with Chris Cole and Zara. I liked that, and I liked that little climax for a reason for the third act climax to happen. I enjoyed this film. I really, really enjoyed this film, and I cannot wait uh, to see what happens next with the Joey King rom-coms, because Joey King is synonymous with the Netflix rom-coms, uh, with the, the Kissing Booth films, and a lot of other films. I, I cannot wait to see what she does next with this. I'm hoping to get more of Zac Efron in rom-coms. He's a likable guy. And Nicole Kidman is very likable. Much more likable than in her other films. She, she's been in it recently. Particularly being the Ricardos. Which as a Lucille Ball fan. I should have liked her more in that film. She was phenomenal. This film was just more up and cheery and gave me everything I wanted in a Netflix rom-com. Not without its problems, but I'm going to get but I'm gonna end up giving uh, a family affair a nice little four out of five stars. On my grading scale, that's gonna add up to about a B plus. I'm very happy with this film and I cannot wait to see what happens next. So next up is going to be the topic of Baby Driver 2 is in development. So Baby Driver 2 has been in development hell for a while. Because this was announced for the first time back in 2020. 2020 ruined a lot of plans. And I mean a lot of plans. So let's take a look at this. Baby Driver 2 is in development. Should, should have got rid of that earlier. It's fine. Uh, so it is in development with the sequel. And it looks like Edgar Wright is reportedly moving on with the sequel. Moving on here. The original movie arrived back in... Two, in uh, in 2017, and even around that time, there was some chatter about them do doing a follow-up. Edgar Wright went on to make Sparks, his Sparks do documentary, and his latest project then, which was Last Night in Soho. But it looks like Baby Driver 2 remains on the stove. Who returns remains to be seen. Looking at this, it turns out that this is going to be still happening because he does have another film coming out very, very soon with Sydney Sweeney, as well as a bunch of other films. So, looking at what we are going to be getting with this, it looks like the whole cast will be returning along with Ansel Elgort. Ansel Elgort and Lily James. Kevin uh, Kevin Spacey will not be returning, but it looks like John Bernthal will. Uh, I could not find the article for it that, that I saw, but John Bernthal is going to be returning. I'm very excited for this because... Baby Driver 2 is a movie I've wanted for a very long time. I really like the first B Baby Driver film. I might actually uh, wa watch that soon because it's been a while since I've rewatched. It's a very fun film. It's an hour and 52 minutes and it doesn't feel like it. The action is spectacular. The cinematography is great. And so El Gore doesn't have a lot to say in the film, but the chemistry and the, and, and the facial acting he does in that film really does make that film worth it. The action top-notch. Edgar Wright is one of the best directors in Hollywood right now, and I'm a big fan of his film, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. That's probably one of my all-time favorite films. It's a comfort film to me. Whenever I'm down, there's a handful of films I can easily think in my mind and quote, and that's one of them, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Baby Driver is one of the best action films I have ever seen. It's one of the most fun action films I have ever seen, and I'm excited for Baby Driver 2. What do you think about Baby Driver 2 coming in development? And are you excited for a potential sequel to Baby Driver? Are you into it? Can you see there being a bit of a draw for a Baby Driver? Because let's take a look at the box office here. The box office for Baby Driver was not a massive hit. It was not a massive hit. But for the budget it had, for the budget it had, it didn't do too bad. So pulling this up here. Pulling this up here. Let me see. There we go. Pulling this up here. It did all right at the box office. It did a very respectable $226 million at the box office. Almost $227 million. And that's even with the 
uh, eh, sorry. That's without adding in the $17 million that it did with the, um, with the, um, the Blu-ray sales. So I want to check the budget here. What is the budget for Baby Driver? It did a oh, wow. It did a very, very nice, a very nice job with its budget of, it looks like $34 million. So with the budget of $34 million, they did a phenomenal job with what they had. The cinematography with the car chases it looks top notch and it doesn't look like it was made on a budget of $34 million. It has a very good score here on Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb and Metacritic. 7.5 out of 10 on IMDb from fans, 92% on Rotten Tomatoes from critics, and a 86 out of 100 on Metacritic. And it's available to watch right now if you rent it or buy it on Apple, on Apple TV or Google Play. Probably on Amazon and Vudu as well, but it's also available to stream on Netflix. So that might be one of my next rewatches very, very soon. What do you think about Baby Driver getting a sequel? And are you excited for a Baby Driver sequel? I want it. I love Edgar Wright. I cannot wait to see what we get from this man again. So there's my thoughts on Baby Driver 2. And what did you think about it? Take a little bit of a, of, of a drink break. Moving on to the next topic. We have a very exciting film coming out on July 5th. And that film is going to be the third in a trilogy, which is going to be Maxine. Maxine reviews are out right now. People have seen it. They gave their, their social reactions, and now they've given their reviews. So let's take a look at some of these reviews. Before I go into this, I will say I don't think X and Pearl are masterpieces. I really don't. I think they are very solid little horror films that did modestly well with their budgets. At only a million to three million dollar budgets, it doesn't take a whole lot to make your budget back here. So looking at the reviews for Maxine, it has a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes right now. So we will t take a look at some of these quick little things here. Emma Wolf. From a spooky astronaut says, I really enjoyed it. It wasn't just horror as I hoped. A 7 out of 10. Uh, with Gregory, it says, Where Maxine Pops is in the world Ty West has meticulously fashioned on screen. Tessa from Mama's Geeky says, Perfectly rounds out the iconic horror trilogy with a dark and gritty noir thriller. Mia Goth is a star. Uh, no... Okay, let's see. Do, do we have anybody bigger? Here we go. William Biviani. I love this dude. Phenomenal. A trip back to the senior side of a decade that that has been sanitized within an inch of its life by condescending corporate exploitation. Guy, guy at the movies, Jeff says, Maxine doesn't have the commanding intensity of its two pre... pre of its two predecessors, operating better on a conclusion to a captivating ca character arc than a particularly immersive film. Still a solid little three out of five. Perry Nemiroff, I respect this woman so much. Just like the first two films, Maxine is powered by assured directing from Ty West and reverence for cinema. Mia Goth also continues to deliver exquisite work. It doesn't take long for her to take your breath away with her performance in this one. Here's a negative review. Uh, if Maxine stopped basking in its, oh wow, in its own self, self, con, con, eh, <clears throat> self congratulatory cleverness for a moment, it might have, it might have had a decent film in there somewhere. IndieWire says it delivers some of the series' most extreme kills as well as its best use of glitterly costumes. Wow. I was not expecting to read this today. Glittery costumes, bloody testicles, and feminist subversion for a whirlwind joyride that doubles as a, a societal lambasting. And Peter. Peter Bradshaw from Guardian says director Ty West goes three for three. Serving up a a horribly watchable 
new episode of his outrageous black comedy franchise of aspirational horror porn, this time set in Hollywood's 1980s. Screen International says, even worse, the film's expected gro gro gross-out violence is subpar, rarely offering the liberating rebuke to the era's uptight hand-wringing. So, there's a little look at some of the reviews. They say it's great. Some people are saying it's just a little too full of itself. So, this film is said to be looking at a modest little opening here. Taking a look at what it is supposed to do. This movie is made on a budget of probably about, what, three, four million dollars? Let me pull this up here really quick. The budget for Maxine looks like it, it doesn't quite say. It does not say. But I'm going to guess anywhere between a good... 10 five to ten million dollars because the, these films are not expensive to make they're not expensive to make whatsoever and that's good for them that's good for a24 and it's good for ty west because if you can make these films phenomenally low budget then you have a good shot at turning a profit and potentially doing more movies with the studio what is the box office projections the box office projections are, uh, it's not going to tell me, is it? That that would that would just make a lot of sense. Okay. If I had to guess, it's going to open between, if I had to guess, it's going to open anywhere between a good three to five million dollars, because looking at what X did, X opened to X opened to four million dollars. It opened up four million dollars on a one million dollar budget. So there you've already gotten your budget back. You've already made your production budget back. You've already made back all of your production costs, all of your advertising buzz, or all all of your advertising budget. $4 million rounding out on a worldwide gross of $15 million. $2 million in Blu-ray and home video sales. Take a look at what Pearl did. Pearl had the same budget of a million dollars, I believe. I could be 100% wrong, but I'm I'm just going with it. What, what Pearl did. Pearl in 2022 opened with... Go down here... It opened with $3 million. So not a great opening. Really not a great opening. But for a movie like this, that one, you opened up against The Woman King, didn't do great at the box office either. And See How They Run didn't do all that well either. But it was in more of like a limited release of 2,400 theaters. Yes, it's limited. But with opening weekend, $3 million, they wasn't going to make a whole ton of money anyways. And to say that Pearl was a bomb, that's not really fair. That's not really fair at all. Because if you look at something like X movie budget, if you look at the budget for X, it's a million dollars. One million dollars. If you look at the budget for Pearl, the Pearl budget was also a million dollars and grows 10.1 million. So... I think this could do a really good three to five million dollar opening if people remember the X franchise. If you're a fan, you're obviously going to be there on opening night or opening weekend. You you will be there. You will give it your money. Generic moviegoers, they won't go and see it. They will not go and see it. Even though people want original cinema, they don't go and support original cinema, original horror, A24, unless it's like a, uh, a everything everywhere all at once. Or unless it's like a civil war, then they'll go and support it. But Maxine reviews are looking to be great. I think it's going to do modestly well at the box office. It's not going to do 20, 30 million by any means, but the marketing budget is definitely higher because I've seen more trailers. I've seen more ads on TV and on YouTube all around the, all, all around the internet than I have for, or, or sorry, than I did for X or for Pearl. So there's my thoughts on that. What do you think about Maxine coming out? Are you excited for Maxine? And are you excited that it's getting good reviews? So next up, we will be talking about 
Downton Abbey 3 sets a release date. So Downton Abbey 3 is very exciting because Downton Abbey 1 and 2 did phenomenally well at the box office. Looking at what they did here in a minute, with the budgets they had, <laughs> those killed. Those legitimately killed. Downton Abbey 3 gets a September 2025 release date. This is coming from Variety. Uh, the Crowley family and their assortment of maids, butlers, cooks, and drivers, and well-heeled relatives and, and various muddied associates will be returning to the big screen next fall. Focus Features has slated the, uh, the Downton Abbey 3 sequel for global release on September 12, 2025. Currently in production in the UK, the film is 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 again is once again penned by Down, Downton Abbey creator Julian Fellows with Simon Curtis returning to direct after he helmed 2022's Down, Downton Abbey A New Era. So taking a look at that cast. That's a phenomenal cast. That is a phenomenal cast. This is what the budget was for the very, very first, only the first one. This was the budget for it. Uh, let me stop sharing that. Sorry about that. I didn't even know that that was still up. This was the budget for the first Downton Abbey. And I'm sure you can tell. I have not seen these films. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I have not seen these films. This movie, the first one, was made for 13 to $20 million. And a new era was made for $40 million. That's a phenomenal, phenomenal numbers. Phenomenal numbers. Take a look at the box office for what those movies did and why they're doing a third one. One, not because it's just such a global phenomenon. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves these films. Based on a 13 to $20 million budget for the first one, the first one domestic already broke even. It already broke even. That should tell you how big of a film the third one is going to be. Because the fans are going to come out in droves for this film. They will come out in droves and it'll probably open n n number one at the box office. Just like number one did. I, I believe it opened at number one. It it made $194.6 million worldwide. That's almost a 50-50 split between the domestic audience and the, and the international audience. This cast is phenomenal. Looking at what it did on opening weekend. On opening weekend, this movie did... What am I looking for here? Here we go, box office. Looking at what it did on opening weekend... $31 million opening weekend. $31 million opening weekend. And it opened at number one. It opened at number one. It opened up against Rambo Last Blood and Ad Astra. Ad Astra. It, it damn near doubled what Rambo did. It damn near doubled what Rambo did. And it damn near doubled what Ad Astra did at $19 million. 31 point, sorry, $31 million opening weekend. Taking a look at what we have with a new era with a $40 million budget, the domestic gross was a bit lower. It was a bit lower because the series had just ended. So it did turn a bit of a profit, a little bit of a profit at $92 million. Not as high as, but I could see this doing another $92 million. If they keep the budget low for it, that's not an issue. If they keep the budget low for this film, lower it down to a good $30 million. And I know that the plots are not going to be phenomenal for this film. It's mostly like, who's coming to dinner? And who's going? And, wh and what are we going to serve? That's probably what the movie is going to be about. The plot has not been announced yet, but it looks like we will be getting a Downton Abbey 3. Maggie Smith is going to return, it looks like. Uh, as as is all of the all of the beloved cast. So, what do you think about this? Are you looking forward to it? Wait, is, is Maggie Smith not returning? Let me take a look at this article one more time because I'm not seeing Maggie Smith anywhere. It doesn't look like it. Oh wait 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 wait. It looks like. Okay. 
So Maggie Smith apparently passed away in a new era. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But it looks like Paul Giamatti will be returning along with Joe Lee Richardson and a ton of other people. So, what do you think about Downton Abbey 3 coming out? Are you excited for it? Were you a fan of Downton Abbey 1 and 2? Were you a fan of the show? I have the show. I just haven't seen it yet. So, maybe in 2020, late 2024, early 2025, I'll start the show. And maybe I'll go and see uh, the third film in the Downton Abbey Now trilogy. What do you think about that? Let me know your comments in the comment. Uh, sorry. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. So the final topic for today, we will not be looking at the box office or the top 10 because I just did a live show earlier early this week looking at the box office and Netflix top 10. I could look at the Netflix top 10 because that has changed a little bit. And this week, there's not a ton coming out. But again, if you want to see that, check out my past live stream on it. So, next up, we will be talking about the final topic. <coughs> Deadpool 3 was dead before Hugh Jackman. So, this was a very interesting news topic to me. Because looking at what we what we have to look at here. Deadpool 3 was dead before Hugh Jackman sent Ryan Reynolds a text. This is coming from The Hollywood Reporter. Looking here, it says here. Oh, really? It is, it is going to move slower, isn't it? That's, that, that's exactly what... Deadpool 3 was dead in the water. Then Hugh Jackman... Ryan and I were at the edge of saying to Kevin Feige... We're not coming up with a story. And that is the moment where Ryan's phone rang, says director Sean Levy. Going down here, a uh, little bit, a little bit more. There it is. Shit. On August 15th in 2022, Hugh Jackman was on a week-long break from his two-year run in The Music Man on Broadway when he was sitting on a beach thinking about what he wanted to do next. And he recalled immediately, he thought, he thought immediately, Deadpool Wolverine, I want to do that movie. Despite being mildly concerned over how he could continue the story of Wolverine after Logan tied up his story so nicely, Jackman called Reynolds right away and told him he wanted to do the film. Reynolds then recounted, thinking he couldn't believe the timing because they were about to have a meeting with Feige and weren't sure what they were going to do. On the Zoom with Kevin, we just cut right to the fucking chase. The the Free Guy star told Va Vanity Fair. We said, look, this call just came in. I feel like we'd be idiots to look at this gifted horse in the mouth and ignore it. This one in a billion chance, I really feel like, is what we've been looking for. Then Hugh Jackman explained that he knew Deadpool would allow him to explore a different side of Wolverine than he had previously, noting everything felt new and fresh to him in the possible storylines they were looking into. I'd be sharing it with Ryan and Sean, who are two of my best friends. The late Miserab Oscar nominee said, the three of us are, the three of us together are like the three amigos. There was not a day where I wasn't in tears laughing. I felt so rejuvenated playing the part. I mean, I'm 25 years in, man, and it feels better than ever. So, they, they, they went on a little bit longer, saying, Levy echoed Hugh, Hugh Jackman's statement about their friendship played into the role in the production of Deadpool and Wolverine. The friendship between the three of us made also made the movie better. He said, you're not embarrassed to try weird, dumb shit. And some of it is going to fail. Some of it doesn't work. But if you're comfortable, but if you're comfortable failing in front of your buddies, you're also going to be comfortable trying stuff that will be inspired. So it looks like Hugh Jackman was the one who got this movie going, which is very exciting because with that, we might not have gotten a Deadpool three this soon. We might not have gotten a Deadpool 3 this soon. If it wasn't for Hugh Jackman <clears throat> sending Reynolds a text, we wouldn't have gotten that film. That's very exciting. That is very exciting. 
What does that mean for the movie, though? Does that mean that there's going to be a ton of buddy humor? Yeah, they're, they're going to pick on each other. They're going to beat each other up. They're, they're, there's probably going to be a phenomenal fight scene between Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman. And there's going to be a ton of digs. There's going to be a ton of cameos. There's going to be a ton of just jokes that will work. Some won't work for some people because it's comedy. Comedy is subjective. But I'm excited for this. I'm very excited for Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds to be in another film together. Because we did get a bit of a taste of that, which was very nice. But Deadpool 3 was dead before Hugh Jackman came back in. What are your thoughts on that? And are you excited for Deadpool 3? Who isn't? Really, who isn't? Will we get a third trailer sooner rather than later? Probably. G giving us a bit more about the plot. Maybe a bit of a couple tastes at more of cameos. But I think the marketing has been great. I'm really happy to know that Hugh Jackman was the one who really got the ball rolling and got the story going for this movie because Deadpool is such a phenomenal franchise. The first two films made bank at the box office as well as as well as well made tons of fans happy. It's an R-rated comic book franchise that we needed. They're violent. They're gory. They're funny. They are sexy. They are amazing. I'm looking forward to seeing what Deadpool 3 gives us. And that might be it for this time, guys. Well, well, well you want to know what? Since I do it every week, we will take a look at this. We will take a look at this every single show. We will take a look at what is number one. So what is number one when it comes to the movies on Netflix? I wasn't going to do it, but what's in the Netflix top ten? So let's take a look here. It has changed a little bit. It will change by Saturday. 100% it will change by Saturday. But taking a look here, we have Trigger Warning still at number one. The Flash is at number two. Home is at number three. The Super Mario Bros. movie is at number four. Minions at number five. Shrek at number six. Lego Movie. The Lego Batman movie at number seven. Fifty Shades of Grey drops from number three down to number eight. Hitman at number nine. And... Ultraman rising at number 10. Taking a look at the TV shows, we have Worst Roommate Ever at number 1, America's Sweethearts, The Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders at number 2, Your Honor at number 3, Bridgerton at number 4, Dexter at number 5, Perfect Match at number 6, uh, Gangs of Galatia at number 7, Queen Charlotte, A Bridgerton Story at number 8, Eric at number 9, and Dancing for the Devil, The, uh, the TikTok Cult at number 8. 10. So there is everything. I believe that number one this week in the movies will be a family affair. Uh, I am looking forward to that. The week after that, number one is going to be hands down. It'll definitely go to uh, Beverly Hills Cop Axel F. So there is that, everybody. Stay tuned because I have a lot more coming to you next week. I'll be doing my reviews of A Quiet Place Day 1 and Minions, as well as Axel Foley F and a lot more stuff. So stay tuned because I got a lot coming to you. And I will see all of you guys next time.